Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galu. Making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale kalu. We know say you chop the money some, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Cause if you really want a revolution, all this for Ben. Hello and uh, welcome to our uh, panel on uh, media in Africa, in particular how it relates to. Um, the, to the U African youth. Uh, we have an excellent group of panelists. and uh, We're just gonna sort of get into um, discussing what it is that everyone dis you know, defines as media. So I'll start with Yemisi. How, how do you, what do you think about when you, when you hear African media? What does it mean to you? Well, I think I definitely um, think about African media in the context of my narrative, right? In terms of representation, uh, but it's also in terms of engagement, um, particularly the, there's a, there's a re reinvigoration of media organizations, policymakers wanting to change the narrative of Africa or create new narratives around Africa. So for me, um, media is a is a, an important element of that in in projecting Africa in the way that we want it to project to, to um, internationally to the world. Um, but also media is a way to be connected um, with each other, particularly when we're talking about social media or even messaging apps like WhatsApp. And you know I remember growing up when living in the UK, growing up and having to go to the phone box to make international calls, right? Arrange your time for people to call you exactly. at, that, at that phone box. Um, but the fact that I can WhatsApp video call so easily now and that sense of connectedness with home makes that physical distance a lot less um, distant, you know. Yeah. So media for me is about um, the outlook for the continent when we speak about media in Africa. Mm -hmm. But it's also about connectedness and the ways in which we remain connected as a diaspora um, in the mm -hmm. UK, where we remain connected with home. Excellent. Chude, how, how, how do you, you, you've had a long time in, in media, how do you, um, how do you think about media in Africa? Um, so I was just thinking to myself in my head about how confident I am when talking to my students about what media now is, and then yeah, suddenly yeah. I'm second-guessing myself. Um, it's the idea of, I remember I was talking to a board member a few years ago, what I consider media, and she said, oh, as I was explaining, she said, ah, a jotting for. And, and I, I don't think when you're about the story is now becoming too, too long. Um, <laughs> and I was trying to say what I always thought media was, which is, its definition has so widened that it's almost like, what is right. it? I don't have a, a differentiation in my mind between media in, in Africa and media outside of Africa, which is first principles, um, whatever we use to send a message from one person, whatever, whatever that is. And I think that in, um, in thinking about that, sometimes a person has to have almost vertigo in going as far back as maybe 300 or 200,000 years ago, where um, you, you didn't have a brand message, for instance, on a T-shirt. So you didn't have a brand message on a cup or a mark of those things at the time. And to understand how how this is radically different from that is to imagine how that didn't exist before, and now that exists everywhere. So that even the banner behind me is media. Yeah. Um, and that is how I've always thought of media. Um, since I started working in here, I think it's, it started from my first job. My first job really expanded my idea of what media was. And it's anything, anything at all, from a mug to a calabash oh. to a tree that helps us send the messages that we desire to people. Now, social media and all kinds of immersive media experiences have, made, have brought that home. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, what we call immersive today might just be a blip on the radar in, in 50 years. So as reality continues to expand, whatever tools exist to help people share the messages that matter would be defined as far as I can see it as media. Mm -hmm. Wale, um, 
I just bring this back to that, that sort of African context, right? Like, like, where are we? Do we have some particular lines that we're drawing when it comes to African media? Or, you know, we're just, it's just media in the world, like every other piece of media. I think that's a fantastic question. And it's so, you know, it's so great to be here. Um, you know, I take a very long view. I think like today, I take a very long view on what, on what media is. Um, but I specifically ground it in place. So I look at what does it mean to have, you know, what does African media mean um, when I look at it from a historical perspective compared to what happens today. And when I look at media, I look at, a, you know, a space in which Africans haven't always been done, you know, justice. Haven't, Africans haven't always, you know, um, had the opportunity to kind of not necessarily tell their stories, but to refute and to kind of disagree. So I'm very pro disagreement. And I think that from this perspective, that's what I think you know, a lot of African media and a lot of the opportunities for African media, you know, can stem from in terms of, you know, really rewriting and also just really enabling, I guess, the world to really rethink a lot of what we think is legitimate, not just about Africa, but about the entire world itself. And I think that when I look at media, so I look at it from three, I mean, about four perspectives, I think about representation and obviously like considering the entire history of African representation. But then I feel like we're now at a point where especially young people are thinking about what Africa means post-representation. What does it mean? You know, what comes after we've been represented? What comes after we own platforms? What comes after, you know, we've, we've seen ourselves reflected in the media? I feel like in Nigeria, for example, we've had expansive um, local media. We've had Nollywood, for example, which has kind of come back in a sort of, you know, nostalgic renaissance. And I think that a lot of people are really looking at, so what comes next? From, you know, from that representative aspect. But there's a lot of talk about representation, but I think on, on this side of the continent, to kind of avoid um, repeating um, issues that are not necessarily reflective of our own reality, the conversation is more, okay, we need more representation, yes, but what comes after that? I mean, we've had, I mean, I grew up with a lot of, you know, with a lot of black faces on the screen. It doesn't mean that, you know, the world itself is representative, but it's also, it also raises questions about, okay, what comes after we have um, that representation? And then the other thing is, you know, like I said, the historical, you know, the historical trajectories. I think like media, like many institutions on the continent has you know, gone through a lot of like ups and downs. We've had an explosion that came after independence with a lot of local media starting up. And then you have a lot of like political instability that kind of caused a lot of, um, you know, that, that caused a lot of slowdowns. And so the question then is, you know, will this happen again? Are we likely to see more clampdowns on press freedom, which we are seeing today? Are we likely to see more social media shutdowns and things like that? So media tends to be a very, very unstable and very uncertain space in that sense. And then the third thing for me about media is how we pay attention. And I think that this particularly applies to social media. So something that's very crucial to me when I consider what African media is able to do is really tap into networks of people. There's so many people online and, and you know, digital media. And I think it all started with, you know, when you consider mobile technology and how we, mm. we were talking about leapfrogging a couple of years ago. And for us, it's kind of like we've caught on to all these technologies. And so there are a lot of us online who are using digital technology to kind of make up for actual physical infrastructure. So for, for a lot of African young people, sure. media tends to be very important. And I'm thinking, for example, of applications like Ushahidi in Kenya, which was really able to crowdsource information. Platforms like that are becoming very, very important. And they're becoming ways in which a lot of us pay attention and a lot of us become activated as citizens. Um, engaging more meaningfully with the world. I think as, as, as young people who are really striving for change, a lot of us tend to be very political, very ideological. But the question is, do we know enough about this continent? Do we know enough about this space? And Africa is a place where, you know, it's very, I, I'm always fond of saying that knowledge about Africa isn't very mainstream. This is something that you learn at universities. It's something that you learn at a, at a very high level. And so African media is really coming at a time where a lot of people are pushing for change, but they also need the information that can guide and inform that kind of change. So it's not just about trying to make an impact in the world, but it's also about making an informed impact. And I think that that's where a lot of African media is being able to play really, really crucial roles. Yeah, but fantastic. Really fantastic opening. Thank you. Thank you all. I mean, it, really great points. Uh, so many, so many great points, actually. The, the last one that I was thinking about is, uh, is how, you know, our understanding of, of, of Africa or other Africans is told to us by, uh, uh, by, uh, not by ourselves, right? By, by international media for the, for most, 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 for the most part. I, I wanted to get into, um, this idea of representation uh, with the MC 
particularly because she's she's done so much great work with uh, her her organization and, and, and research um, in terms of uh, the, you know gender representation uh, in in African media, trying to understand um, what the state just a, sort of the broad question: what's the state? uh in 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 as non-academic and as simple terms <laughs> as you can um what's the what what's what's what's, what's the state of, of of gender representation in, in in african media today i mean are we doing a good job uh are, are, are things <laughs> particularly dire I, 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 i'm fascinated to hear from you well i think the best i'm going to answer that from two perspectives both in terms of women that work in the media so the representation of women working in the media okay. as well as the representation of women in media context of african women in media context mm -hmm. and that is something that my organization african women in the media that we kind of focus on yes. on both sides so picking up the first one we'll talk about the representation of african women in media industries in terms of positions um we're not doing very well is the is the, is the summary um in in south africa we see a lot of improvement in terms of women in leadership positions so for example yeah. recent recent research so it shows that 47 percent of editors in south african news media are women are female so there's almost a 50 50 divide and um, parity there in terms of leadership position but in other parts of the continent it's not so not so great particularly in nigeria as well um, there is a limited number of women in media, news media leadership. Um, and also the notion that women prefer certain kind of roles within these media so far, perhaps presenting, uh, presenting on TV or reporting on fashion and health, on so-called soft news. Yes. So there is, there is an issue of adequate representation. Mm -hmm. hierarchies and positions of power because obviously when you don't have women in positions of power in media organizations that where you get you, you lead to certain barriers of entry so for example um gendered allocations of resources which means that certain stories are allocated more to male journalists than female journalists you need to think like sexual harassment as well right so the the idea is that the more women there are in leadership positions the better they Work in the media industries, and why that is important is that you know if, if we assume that women represent fifty percent of the population of the world or any country, then the way in which we're going to tell stories about ourselves, right, is going to be different from the way in which a, a male-dominated newsroom is going to construct stories about women, right, exactly. or or identify gendered issues or gender angles in news stories. Tell me, t talk a little bit about. Uh... How this because because this this panel is about African youth. Um, so can you talk a little bit? You talked about your daughters there, particularly on the continent. Uh, even if you were going to focus on Nigeria, but if you think about Africa in general, um, how young girls are impacted by the images um, and this and the, and the coverage uh, or the or the lack thereof um, that we have today. So again, it's, that, it's making that connection between representation and ambition, right? Mm. Representation and who you believe you can be. Mm. Okay, so that's where it really connects with the youth. And I use my daughters as a very valid example. I remember mm. when my first daughter was two, and that's when Frozen came out with um, Elsa and a long blonde hair. Mm. And that was the first time my daughter noticed that she had Afro hair, right? And she's thinking, well, which cat? And I'm trying to actively look for cartoon representations for her that look like her mm. right but now she felt really conscious about her afro hair so these kind of things um you know like i said thinking about how we as ourselves feeling in those spaces so that if i'm looking for a cartoon representation of my daughter of a, of a black girl with afro hair mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's somewhere i can go to to find that you know i don't mm. have to wait for disney to do a, a cartoon on that so I think there is that consciousness of thinking about youth at different stages and the extent to which we're representing them and making them see themselves in other roles. Again, I've talked about new sources, right? It's mm -hmm. you know, seeing, seeing a, I mean, one example I'll give you, in the last few months um, since the lockdown and the Black Lives Matter movement in America, in the UK, I've noticed that a lot of the mainstream channels have made a conscious decision. And I, I like to believe the conscious decision because I've not seen it before. But there's a lot more 
black women, black men used as new sources. I've never seen anything like it in the years I've been living here. But mm. literally, there's a lot more. And you, and my daughters have noticed, right? Mm. Daughter, Interesting. She's like, oh, she's a scientist. I want to be a scientist, right? Mm. And you cannot you cannot underestimate the impact of such representation. So again, I'm speaking both in the context of the continent and us being conscious about not leaving our narratives elsewhere and not blaming, not, it's not about, even about blame, but not waiting for Disney to make this kind of content. But mm. also, African diaspora, thinking about <clears throat> thinking about the extent to which we are adequately represented and the impact that has on our on, on our children, and um, mm. but also in terms of women that work in the media. Again, I, I'm currently in the middle of and almost finished the research looking into the barriers of entry into journalism for mm. women in sub-Saharan yeah. Africa, and uh, one of the things I'm finding is that while at university stage. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, female students at the media studies and the stuff like that. Media yeah. studies, mass communication, etc. Mass communication, yeah. But their experiences when they now get to the point of trying to enter the industry is that they're facing things like gendered pay gaps, right, or majorly facing things like sexual harassment. Mm. Okay, so that's why what I said earlier about having a more equal balance of of men and women in, in media leadership is important having po gender policies or policies that look at more consciously look at these kind, kind of barriers of entry is important because these are our next generation of media producers and if they're facing those kind of barriers at the point of entry then we're not preparing the environment for um, for youth entering media on the continent okay. where are things right now we've had i mean at quartz we've written a lot about you know internet shutdowns and all that kind of thing and and I, and because I know you have a big picture kind of view in your research, um, I wanted to get a, a sense of where things are from you now. Well, I think I think the experience the experiences really differ across across the mm -hmm. continent. So, for my PhD research, I looked at the media relationship between Nigeria to Nigeria and South Africa, and particularly I was looking at the regulations of the media, the media laws in the country. And so what we found was that in Nigeria, for example, the laws were so open to interpretation that then for, that for allow the government to have that those kind of levels of clampdown that they do. Um, South Africa, not so much, but the, the issue there was that, the, and I don't know how much, it's, I'm sure it might have changed by now, but the issue there was that um, the ownership um, was, was open, but not quite open in the sense that you're invited, I think it's CASA ICAB, I see a essay um, bring out a call for a certain kind of channel and then people pitch to set up right. that channel, basically. So it's kind of open in terms of you being able to pitch your channel, but also not open in terms of the fact that it needs to come as an invitation. Again, I did that sort of a few years back, so I'm not sure how it's changed. And um, But in recent times, what we've seen a lot of is various ways in which um, governments are clapping down on freedom of expression, both yeah. in terms of freedom of the media, but also freedom of its citizens. So there's a lot of countries looking into social media bills. In Tanzania, you've got the Cyber Crimes Act, yes. which Amnesty yes. International has talked about as being quite, you know, um, limiting on press freedom. And Chad also issued their own social media bill, which is quite funny when you consider the low penetration of social media. <laughs> yeah. Um, but basically, all these laws, and we've got Gambia, Ethiopia. I mean, if you look at the recent um, recent conflict, the month or two ago, and they pretty much shut down the internet. You know, yeah, sure. Sure. there was no way for even government parasites to contact the outside world um, and yeah. through the internet for for about a week or so. So it's these kind of authoritarian and stringent approaches to stifling freedom of expression in the guy under the guise of tackling fake news and misinformation. So it's always presented as we're trying to save you from fake news and misinformation. But actually, I think the issue here is, is the difference between putting in regulation and media governance, right? I think right. they need to understand the differences. Is, is social media, in terms of tackling fake news and misinformation and all those things, should it be a, a law? Should it be a bill? Or should it just be a, 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 a governance in terms of um, things within the industry, right? And how the industry themselves are going to um, act on these kind of things. So I think the, the governments need a better understanding of the differences between regulation and governance. 
and what, which one is the best approach to take. In Nigeria, we've heard that I think Nigeria copied and pasted Singapore's yeah. social media bill without yeah. really consider, considering, you know, that's not to say that globally government, governments are not looking at social media bill, they are. And there is grounds for for governments to, to look at their platforms. Yeah. It's, you know, is it, is it about the platforms or the citizens, right? So right. you have Google and Twitter, which who, who have moved away from things like political um, advertising, whereas Facebook is steadfast and still there. Right, so it's right. about how they are working with these platforms um, to tackle these things, or is it about trying to punish the citizens who are using this, um, these platforms to engage and to express themselves? Right, um, right. So, so I think there's there's an element to which some of these bills represent a lack of, at best, represent a lack of understanding um, mm -hmm. by those who are trying to push the bill. And at worst, it's just another opportunity for them to start to control. Them. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a great quote. I, I, I love to um, reference from uh, Ban Kole Ruafemi, who was a uh, founding editor of Tech Cabal. And I was just, as a conference, it was about four years ago, and he, and he said this great thing about, which I always misquote, but he said this great thing about how um, Facebook and Google know more about African youth than any African government. And it was a very kind of a very casual, casual thing, and there's no you know sort of pure evidence or data on that, but you kind of instinctively know, <laughs> you instinctively know that's right, right? And that kind of is what bothers these governments, right? That yeah. we don't know what these young people are up to, but Mark Zuckerberg does. <laughs> and the, the issue of data is really important because yeah. even from doing our job as journalists, mm -hmm. I remember I was in an investigative story a few years ago and I had to go and look at the World Bank for a data that Nigeria should have or that right. um, or the other country and um, Cameroon should have, right? Mm -hmm. But they, in terms of their, their approaches to gathering data, there just isn't. No. And even the idea of open data is, is such a big international topic. But you know, we can do all the training we want for journalists to do go and do data journalism and data um, and access data and how to do things like um, freedom of information right. um, right. requests. I, yeah. But they don't function very well, you know, and the data is just isn't there. So it's really, especially when 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 we're talking about this change in the narrative agenda, which I f I'm fully behind, but when we ourselves are not collecting our own data and we don't have our own data and we're having to rely to to the West for our own data. I think there's something wrong there. There's a disconnect with our ambitions and what, what should be happening in reality. Mm, mm, mm. Um, let me bring Chud in here very briefly on that relationship between media and governments, because I'm interested in your take, because you've, you've seen it on both sides of, of, of the fence, so to speak. What are the challenges, you know, for, for governments in terms of, challenge for African governments in terms of, uh, relationship with the media what are the challenges and and, and who's doing it right mm. um when ABC was speaking i thought she was going to he said at best a lack of representation i thought she was going to say at worst perhaps insanity <laughs> i literally thought she was going to say insanity <laughs> um, you know one of the things i learned in the past i've learned in the past i mean I, i'm invested in a company that that um has worked with governments across the continent and one of the things i observed and one of the things i've tweeted before is we should is i think it's something that joe biden says his his father told him um which is never credits and i don't think it's an original quote i don't think it could be an original quote of the bidens but it's i don't don't blame malevolence malevolence where oh, simple, yeah. stupidity, simple stupidity will suffice yeah, yeah. and true. i would be so tired of coming into social media and seeing people credits of Machiavellian um, um, strategy on behalf of a particular African government behind a particular policy, a particular declaration. Yeah, because yeah, time yeah. you sit in the room with these guys, these things are not well thought out. They are not, um, it's not a comprehensive, rigorous <laughs> system of debate and data. That's, like, that's actually quite reassuring to hear because that's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> <It's> not. <laughs> yeah. That's what it looks yeah, like. Exception. <laughs> I mean, there are a few exceptions, for, for instance, in yeah. Rwanda. I mean, I haven't worked in Rwanda, but um, for all we know from Rwanda, there is a systematic, you know, um, desire to, sh to, to use an euphemism, shape the narrative inside yeah. and out of that government. But in most of the countries, there's just not. There's just governments who are panicked by what um, um, 
but you've quoted from Bankoli. And it's not that they are panicked because they have independently verified that. It's just a, oh, this is like the Nigerian social media bill, you know. Um, it was just one or two senators who had been offended by something, bringing the bill into the House, that the House didn't really spend any time really debating. So just like, oh, there's this pesky thing. Let's just, like, we don't even need it anyway. Let's close it down. We're not even thinking about applications. We're not thinking about the pushback. They didn't anticipate any organized pushback. Because even until now, when people think of social media, they think it's something driven by young people. Hmm. And when they think of young people, they associate young people with powerlessness. So when they are hmm. implementing or promoting, they're not expecting yeah. any systematic pushback. Right. Not expecting any thoughtful response. They right. assume that it's as easy as shutting down a factory in Uganda or shutting down a factory on the outskirts of a crowd or something. So that's where it really is. There's this sense that there's something coming for these governments, you know, that they, they, that's the sense that they have. Something is coming, something is coming. They don't know what it is. They don't mm. understand it, but their reflex is command and control. So it's like right. if something is coming, they don't understand it, shut it down. You know, they don't know that there are things such as the servers in different countries. They do not understand that people can bypass firewalls and bypass things. It's just yeah. how can we shut it down? And yeah. so that is the premise uh, behind it. Unfortunately, the thing about this is that, uh, unfortunately, when the ignorant have power, it's no less uh, destructive. So the fact that they do yes. not know what they are doing doesn't reduce the effect of it. But if we understand yes. where it's coming from, then it's easier to think, to, to, to beat them at the game because they don't even know what game they're playing. Mm -hmm. Let me give the last, let me just give a last word to Kiamisi before I think she is going to leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> on, on, on just a, a few words on, on social media and, you know, what uh, the challenges are for African governments just your thoughts on that and what you've seen? I, I think definitely there needs to be something done on fake news and misinformation. Mm -hmm. Disinformation, what, yeah. What, what ha and this disinformation, exactly, and the, this our idea of post-truth. I think what happened with the American elections is an example why. Um, I think also there's a lot of people who are using platforms um, like Twitter and Facebook to, to, to um, ignite hate and divide, especially in a country like Nigeria, there's things that can be so volatile. Um, but, you know, law and bills is not necessarily the, the, the first point of um, approach. Mm. How are we engaging with these platforms to tackle it? How are we making sure that Facebook does take a hard, um, hard approach on, on bringing down certain political communication? How are we making sure that certain things do not go on YouTube? I think the, the first point of call should be in terms of those platforms and the kind of things when which we're supporting or governments are supporting them to make sure the content on their platform are not causing harm. But then that brings in the question of how do you define harm and who, who gets to make that definition that something is harmful or not. So there's, there's a whole kind of public sphere um, debate around terminology, around who makes the decisions and how those, those decisions differ across cultures and, and countries. And I think internationally, there needs to be a lot more connectedness in how we are approaching this. Um, more agreements, like so you say, exactly, from the African exactly. Union or, or you exactly. know, bodies like that. Exactly. Right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, are there any platforms of, of the of the big ones that you think are any more egregious than than the others in terms of? Um, well, well I, I would I would say Facebook could be doing a lot more. Google and um, and Twitter are, are taking some hard hard steps. Um, YouTube also did something recently where they where they banned certain kind of conspiracy theory videos. Um, I think Facebook is the one that's lagging behind out of all of them. And also, there's the recent conversation around TikTok, and mm. well, we don't want to go too much into the, the conspiracy yeah. there of TikTok and Huawei and China and all that. There's that, that whole conversation, and you're talking a little bit about data and how these platforms are collecting and using our data is really an area for all. But discussion, and those are the kind of things that the government should be looking at, like how are you discussing and working with these platforms in terms of how they use our private information, our data, rather than trying to ban us from kind of having access to information. 
So yeah. that would be my that would be my uh, my thoughts in terms yeah. of beginning to re reimagine how governments in Africa should be addressing yeah. issues yeah. on social media. Well, thank you very much for your time. I mean, really, thank really you. appreciate it. And uh, I wish we could have a bit more time to, to go. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> great conversation, but I'm pretty sure we'll pick it up again um, in person very soon after COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we will. Right. But, but thank you for your time. Have a good time. Thank you. So, guys, I wanted to just come back to, uh, you know, the, the very excellent discussion Yemisi had there about gender representation and to just maybe to get Trudy in here on just underrepresentation of uh, minorities or underrepresented groups in general in African media and how African media does uh, mm. with groups that don't typically, you know, frankly get a fair shake. Mm -hmm. Well, so if the thing about it, there's almost no minority group that is not over underrepresented <laughs> in media across the continent, especially in local national media. I, I am hard pressed um, to think of beyond, the first problem is we don't even have a lot of data, country specific data, but I do know that in the work I've done beyond say a few countries like uh, Botswana or Namibia, um, very few countries even make an attempt to pretend. So when I hear certain countries arguing about political correctness, I say that many African countries can do with some political correctness because here there is not even an understanding that minority voices deserve to be heard on several levels. Um, many of the con global conversations we are having about representation of women, representation of you know, ethnic groups, you know, representations that have to do with color, representations that have to do with sexuality, many of these conversations don't even exist in let's look at nigeria where we're shooting from in if you go to biosa state television or go to river state tv or go to you know rake tv there is no it's not even like the conversation hasn't even started now the places where these conversations even exist where the boundaries are being pushed are in the media that, that are consumed by for want of a better classification middle class people. And by middle class, I'm not just talking about middle class economically, I'm talking about the middle class psychographic. So there are people who may not have middle class incomes, but are in middle class networks or middle class communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those conversations are being had on that level. But this conversation hasn't gone below the surface in Nigeria. We have to have I mean, so we can see in terms of gender, those conversations are seeping through gently, but ever so slowly. In terms of everything else, in terms of everything else, in terms of any particular category in which there is a minority in Nigeria, there is still not a consciousness. And it's, I can speak authoritatively of a conversation in Nigeria, I can speak authoritatively of a conversation in the Republic, I can speak about a conversation largely in uh, 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 Cote d'Ivoire. I can speak of conversation in Cameroon. This convers there is not even a movement towards inclusivity in the conversation. So, um, I starting from there, it's very difficult to even say what should we do, where should we go from. Now, of course, the media is not a particular corporate. This is a larger social issue of um, mm -hmm. minorities being silenced, and minor minor minority experiences not even seen as legitimate you know uh, in the mainstream in many countries so what the media does is that the media reflects the larger trends in these many countries um and then even when, so when people begin to push i remember when um paul kagame was in was, was on the media tour in the states i don't know i think it was the, you know, the kenyan president was in the media tour in the states uh, many years ago when obama after obama visited his country and was asked about um um, say gay rights in his nation and he said oh these issues are not important to us we have more serious issues like hunger so the problem is when you begin to talk about representation the quick retort that people want to maintain the existing narrative is oh we have more important issues and of course the conversation is there is nothing more important than the ability of people's voices to be heard and for the existences 
to be acknowledged in the media. So, but that argument has a lot of currency that, oh, we have bigger issues, we have corruption, we have poverty, we have uh, insecurity. Those arguments have a particular potency mm. you know, in a society with multiple issues. So it's like, how do, how do, you, how do you bust through that? How do you force people to yeah. have pockets of conversations that are important even when there's overriding important conversations. That's the question we're still struggling to answer at this point. Yeah, no, that's really fantastically well uh, laid out. I mean, Wally, are you, is this something that you, you guys have done uh, at the Republic, you've done some really interesting work on, you know, a variety of things that, you know, uh, that let's say Nigerian media doesn't typically cover, obviously the most uh, obvious one that comes to mind is uh, your coverage on, on Biafra and the history. Is this something that you, in terms of representation and telling story, untold stories or stories that we have tried to sweep under the carpet, is this something that you feel is an important part of, of the work that uh, you do and I guess other media should be doing? Um, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, it, on the continent, even within Nigeria, that isn't necessarily reflected um, in the media that we produce and even consume. Um, I think in the first place, you know, I, I'm always thinking of, of, of this play by Professor Wale Fonsa. He wrote this play called A Play of Giants. And it's a, it's a kind of like satirical play about African dictators. And in the, I think there's an introduction to the play where he asks, you know, how, that in a way, basically, he mentions that Africa is a continent that has produced, or how could a continent like Africa, you know, you need to explain how a continent like Africa could produce, um, you know, leaders like Desmond Tutu, but also leaders like Idi Amin. And I think it just speaks to the diversity of the characters that we find on the continent. But what you find is in the media that we consume, it's not as we don't necessarily strive towards showing that complexity and showing that, um, and showing mm -hmm. just that complex reality yeah. or the multi-dimensional reality that we live in. I totally agree with um, with Chile, with Chile on, on, you know, on, the, on, on the truth, which is that there are a lot of multiple issues in Nigeria, in a lot of African countries, and it's immediately seen as, you know, we should be focusing on one instead of the other. But you know that these issues are connected, and I feel that part of the media world and part of what we do try to um, try to do at the public is show how these issues are connected and how they also affect marginalized groups even more. So it's not just that you know we have corruption; it's that corruption also affects disproportionately affects vulnerable pe people who tend to be women and young people. And so you know it's how it's really then sitting in that position and really trying to carve out that space, you know, from which you can then you know show people just how these issues that we understand have multiple dimensions and multiple implications on the people that live um, that live around us. And something that we always find is, of course, there's a pushback. I mean, in, you know, to a lot of the stories, to a lot of the, uh, a lot of the themes that we try to cover, something that's been very particular to us is ensuring that you know, experts tell these narratives. That we find people who are either living these realities or have done serious work in these spaces. And yet, there's still a lot of pushback because there's you know, overarching narrative that a lot of people kind of feel more comfortable with knowing. We saw this when we did, you know, topics on Biafra. We've seen this when, we, when we've done topics about feminism, about women's rights. We've seen this when we've covered stories about sexuality and really, the, you know, these issues which are very much present today. Something that's always been very important to me is realizing that there's a lot going on in the world that's also happening here. And there's a lot that's happening that we can actually inform and that we can actually shape and improve global understanding of. But it often feels like when you look at when you look at African media, when you look at Nigerian media, it, you know it would suggest that we're completely on different planets. It would suggest that you know there's all these women marches, there's you know climate change discussions happening all around the world, but they don't seem to be happening on the continent, or they don't seem to be amplified because they are happening on the continent. And at the same time, you also find that a lot of Africans tend to be experts in these fields. You find that we are stationed all, you know all around the world. You find that. You know, we do have the Chimamandas of the world who are really shaping and informing, you know, how the world and how the public understand serious topics or serious concepts like feminism. But you don't find that appreciation or that, you know, that level of, 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 of promotion on the continent itself or within continental media. And that's why I feel like there's a lot more effort that needs to be made in really reconnecting the people who live on the continent with what is actually happening on the continent, as opposed to what they believe is happening or the narratives that we, um, or the overarching narratives 
that we that we think are happening. And that's why I always go back to that, you know, to that play, that you know, the line I, I mentioned in a bit of time. We do have leaders like Tilamanda who are shaping how people understand the world. And they are Nigerian. And they're doing it in very Nigerian ways. And then the question for us is how do you promote more of that? Because there are more Nigerians in more spaces like that and doing very serious work to that level. But the question then becomes, you know, as a media, you know, as media, how do we promote those people and how do we ensure that even within the continent and even within like our local spaces, those voices are being heard as well. I mean, you both of you have been are entrepreneurs in in media entrepreneurs, right? Which is a very I, I, and I'm someone who's covered media business, so I always think about media entrepreneurs as a very particular animal, right? Like it's not just like I'm going to go buy something uh, for for ten naira instead of for twenty naira, you know? Like it's just a different mindset uh, that a media entrepreneur has. I, I'm interested in how um, you've used the internet because it's the internet now uh, to to think about the like the way Wale is just maybe out there. Uh, maybe today you can get into it. Just how you um, you look at the media and you say, "Well, we're going to tell these types of stories because we know, you know, X newspaper isn't going to cover that type of thing, uh, and we're just going to open it up." It's, it's interesting. This year, I spoke to, um, I did an interview. I haven't got by by um, what's the word to use for that now? I published. A conversation uh, with um, B.C. Alim, who was the first um, Nigerian to, to to come out of the closet on national TV. Mm -hmm. And when I was when I released it, I realized it's actually about fifteen years since I first when B.C. was on TV the first time fifteen years ago, and I was a producer of the show at the time. And that show was cancelled. That show, the, the airing of that show, led to the cancellation of New Dawn, uh, or uh, um, some of its uh, airing times on the NTA network at the time. And after that, the only place you could find, and I think the tape was seized and all of that, anywhere you could, the only place you could find bits and pieces of that interview are on YouTube. Mm. And fast forward 15 years or 17 years after now, and I couldn't put that interview on television in Nigeria. This is 15 years after. Uh, my partner stations, and I don't blame them, it's not their fault, but the NBC said, look, we can't put this on. It violates the broadcasting code. And I was shocked. I thought, how can 15 years have passed? You know, and we've had all this huge national and international progress on this issue. And I'm facing the exact same problem. So ultimately, I could only put that interview on YouTube yet again. Um, and I think that actually captures where we are as a society in terms of these issues. Without the internet, so many stories could not possibly be told. There is no way I cannot imagine when I did the interview with Busala Dakolo last year, making such an accusation against a powerful Nigerian pastor. There is no Nigerian station that would have published it. Um, and even when we were trying to get the stories of more women who wanted to speak out, and we invited, because I thought as a man, I couldn't do all the other interviews. And we invited some popular broadcasters who were female. Their stations didn't permit them to have the conversation. So What's the issue uh, there? What is the issue for them there? What do you think there was? Also, they have legal challenges. And unless there is a court case, they would be liable to be sued or the subject of the confession could report them to the NBC and they could be fined. Yeah, mm -hmm. the problem with the NBC's codes and many of the codes that govern many of the laws that govern the media in Nigeria is that they are so ambiguous and so vague mm -hmm. that they can be interpreted in the worst possible way. And so, for stations, if there is no clear financial incentive to take a risk, then they are not going to take that risk. Yeah. And what's remarkable that that hasn't changed. I began to work in television in 2000, yeah, with the foundation of NTA. And 20 years after, none of that has changed. You know, the voices have changed, the cultural influences have. So what has happened is that the cultural influences have ignored traditional media, so to speak, <laughs> and created their own space, as it were. Um, why Niger? 
uh, is presently doing a series on rape culture in Nigeria for a special project this quarter. A quarter ago, last quarter, I did a special series on um, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on on sexuality, and we're trying to partner with a newspaper on that. And this is a newspaper that's partnered with us on all kinds of things: the future of what's Africa, which today to see. And they wouldn't. They said to do this series, they had to go to the publisher to get approval. So, um, so without the internet, we would be a lot of conversation would not even be happening in the first place. Without um, digital platforms, whether video digital platforms or social platforms or text-based platforms, many com the culture would freeze up. The culture would 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 stay, for want of a better word, coagulated. Um, it's the internet that has given Nigeria the opportunity to participate in global progress. Mm. It's the internet that has given many African countries, especially in West, East, and Central Africa, it's the internet that has given them the opportunity to participate in both of those conversations. Now, something else that's remarkable that we need to talk about. Um, one of my favorite books was Prisoner, I think it's Factfulness by Hans Rosling, who is now dead. Mm -hmm. I used to talk about the fact that people say that um, big corporations are a problem to the world. And maybe they are in America, and maybe they are in parts of Europe. But in Nigeria and many African countries, big multinational corporations that use technology to disrupt media are the saviors of progressive culture. It is because of Netflix, for instance, that we can have where we can Nigerians young people for three thousand five hundred naira can watch Blood and Water or watch certain movies or watch certain series that push the culture. It is because of Facebook or Twitter or YouTube that people can have access to an entire breadth of experiences and possibilities that a young guy who is in Kano or a young woman who is in Kano who doesn't want to be a Christian or a Muslim and wants to be an atheist. It's because of these internet based platforms and the financial muscle of these global corporations that that young woman for the cost of data or young man for the cost of data can have access to a kaleidoscope of experiences. So I, when I hear people talk about these challenges, I say it ha they have to be contextualized. For us here, the internet is not just a net blessing, it's a gross blessing because without it, the culture will be narrowed down and so many people's voices and experiences will be completely silenced. That's mm. that is the reality. Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, very well put, actually. Uh, Wale, um, I'm thinking about that. I'm coming at it from a different angle for the next question, which is kind of thinking about what is the what what, what is the responsibility or, or the challenges as we think about you know diaspora having that influence um, on on media. Uh, on the continent, what, how do you have you thought about this? Is this something that you, you take into account? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very it's a very interesting question that you asked because for us, you know, at the Republic, everyone always asks, you know, when you when you think of who your audience is, who is that, you know, who is that audience? You know, the diaspora comes with a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, thinking about it from a financial sustainability sense, from growth sense, yes, and even from you know, even from an editorial sense. But you know, where where the challenge then comes is really balancing that line of showing, you know, what is really going on and really representing what is really going on, even sometimes beyond um, the demands of diaspora audiences. And I think, you know, something that's very important is, is, is a recent piece in the New York Times. Um, I think it came out either today or, or yesterday that speaks to, you know, the future of foreign correspondents. Because sometimes I don't like a bit of, you know, if you're engaging any diaspora audience, you're kind of, you know, engaging some sort of foreign correspondence. You're covering a particular region, even though you're based there, you you, you, you engage with the region rigorously. You're still kind of also ensuring that you're, to some extent, you're reporting to an audience that may not necessarily live here. And what the piece was basically saying is that, you know, foreign correspondence is changing and the way that people engage with, I guess, international audiences is changing. So from the perspective of the Republic, it's not just that we have diaspora readers or subscribers, it's also the fact that if we do publish something that is not accurate, the people who are more likely to hold us accountable are local people. And I think that for any media, you know, for any media base that's engaging with the diaspora audience, that also kind of recognizes the influence of, of diaspora communities, they are, all, they are also at the same time recognizing the increasing influence of local communities as well. Because local communities are online, they, they run blogs, 
and they will call you out on, on the inaccuracies. And it happens whether or not you are, you know, a Nigerian media house or a non like In fact, if you're a Nigerian media house, I feel, I feel like it's even <laughs> the judgment is even steeper if you know like what are you what what are you what are you trying to do? But I think to the larger question of what, you know, of, of where the internet fits into all of this, you know, for us at the Republic, it's really looking at the internet as a source of you know, topics and as a source of trends and as a source of what is really missing um, from the conversation. Simply again, because we know that, you know, we only started really publishing in 2018. And so the internet has been very useful for us. Really getting an approximation, and I say an approximation because it's a very slim approximation of what the thinking is when it comes to Nigeria, at least from the people who are, who are based here. And what you find is that people are very opinionated. People want, people disagree a lot on a number of issues. But you also find that people disagree a lot on a number of issues because they don't have enough of you know enough knowledge about those issues. They disagree about whether you know they disagree about whether feminism is African because we haven't been shown examples of African feminist action or African feminist lives. They don't understand or they or they disagree on how climate change might affect the continent because we don't really see much, you know, we don't really see much information at that level. Instead, where that information is, is within, you know, you know, tones in libraries where you have to really dig, you know, where you have to really dig in. And, you know, no one in these days has either the time or enough access to those sorts of materials. And so when media houses, when the Republic has been able to come in, is really trying to, you know, it's really in balancing that line and really looking at, okay, what is it that people don't understand? Where are those information gaps? Where are those knowledge gaps? And where can we follow the conversation and take it forward? And who do we know within a wide, you know, within within the expert network that we have that can write on this topic, that can provide the much needed perspective on this topic? And that's where we try to have, you know, fill in that gap. It comes with its own challenges as well. Like I said, you know, we do get moments where people on the continent or people in, in, in the local, you know, that are really directly affected by the issue reach out to us and tell us this is not actually the story this is not what is going on but for us that also means it's an opportunity to engage those people and to perhaps even get them to write and to provide you know additional context towards those issues so as much as they can be pushed back it's also thinking about ways that we can turn push back into you know additional content into additional information that we can then spread and you know and, and publicize as well so it's kind of like you know it really it's, it's a feedback mechanism it's, it's, it's all within a loop that influences you know, of, of one community influencing the other, influencing the other as well. Really interesting. I find this conversation, this part of the conversation particularly, you know, personal because, you know, we've had this experience with Quartz Africa. Um, and, and one of the, one of the many fascinating things about this is how people are more interested in seeing African names telling African stories. It's been interesting to see that it's not just Africans that also want authentic stories. This is the this is the moment in which we are. And it's also a, a come back to to something that uh, YMC brought up as well, which is this whole idea of um, representation of experts, right? To have you know Africans be the experts as well in in explaining Africa. Mm -hmm. in exp do you want to do you want to come in on, on on diaspora i mean how how it looks for you from your perspective in terms of the influence and impact just a quick point that just occurred to me like i've never thought of that before often when i when i often say that when we are talking about representation most times i think that the subtext of representation is access yeah the idea that when when particular peoples are represented it makes it easier for other people of their for want of a better word kind to come into the room and mm -hmm. so i used to say to myself i really i used to say i don't really care if it's a chinese talking about you know Enugu, a chinese talking about kigali i've never i used to say i didn't really care until i understood the second and third other effects of that like when people who represent the experience are in the room it's easier to pull other people along. It's easier to bring other people into the space. It's easier to introduce people into the space. So that's how I began to understand for myself how important representation as it was, because it was like the first step. When we are represented, then we can get access. When we get access, then there can be a more even equal representation of all experiences. And my storytelling, especially the global part. That's all I just. I mean, just any big picture points that you take out of the conversation that you probably hadn't considered or 
mm. uh, new views on on media in Africa. Just, just the idea that there's a lot of there's a lot of progress in in Nigerian and African media, but most of it is still focused in terms of organized media, still focused on educated young people with internet access. And there's huge sections of the Nigerian audience that are just completely left out of the conversation. And that frightens me because those people who are disconnected from these big change driving conversations are still part of the voting populace, are still part of the buying populace, are still part of the deciding populace. The 14 year old young man or woman who has no access to any of the new representations, any of the new stories, any of the new issues being discussed, it's going to be a father or a mother or a wife or an auntie or an uncle and have influence over large swaths of the population. I would be being overly dramatic if I say it keeps me up at night, but if there's something next to keeping me up at night, that does that for me. And that is, so basically media literacy. That's, that's, yes. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a serious. It's a, it's a serious problem. problem. It's a big one. It's a big one. And there's not enough financial incentive to take the risks to create content or to to create platforms that reach those people. That's a problem. So we do not even the media space financial in Nigeria is a very tiny space in mm -hmm. terms of GDP, in terms of every it's a very tiny space. And so there's a lot of us playing in the same pond. Yes. Just because it's too expensive and too risky to reach outside that point. Somebody has to take that risk. And it, more and more, it's seeming to me like the only financial incentive to do that will come from patronage, not investment. Because mm -hmm. even I can't legitimately make an, a revenue-based case to any large-scale media investor considering the low income potential to right. reach those so it becomes a special kind of conundrum, a special kind of one. This is the real social problem. But many social problems are solved when somebody has an incentive, a public interest incentive, a financial incentive to solve that problem. But there's no financial incentive here, and there's no government who is thinking about the public interest perspective of widening, widening access for illiterate people, so to speak. So how do you solve that problem? I don't know. It's just one of those things that you're like, I can't see a pathway to solving this problem, but someone has to solve it. And it's most likely going to be those of us in the media who will find the incentive to solve it. How do you find that incentive? I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. uh, do you have any last thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think for me, it's, you know, you're, it's definitely true. You know, it's one of the reasons why you know, I think as some, you know, as, as a platform that was started in 2018, it was very important to, to us with the Republic to really try and balance the line of, of, of getting, I guess, an already informed audience here, or, or let's say an already, you know, educated audience, and then, you know, match that with, with, with a diaspora audience. But I think for me these days, some, you know, one of the things that really, you know, that really, um, I guess, keep me up at night is really looking at, you know, just, you know, the necessity of, of really strong editorial direction. And I think that, that really influences a lot of, you know, a lot of the projects that we're starting at the Republic, a lot of the projects that we're running at the Republic is always done from, you know, what is our ideology, what is our perspective, and how do we ensure that this, you know, this influences the way that we work? Because, you know, at this point, it's for me, as someone who is, as someone who is balancing I guess two, you know, two communities, a, a diaspora audience and a local audience, really understanding their specific need and where they match and where they meet, you know, our own core values has always been very, you know, very important because I guess core values are, you know, are already really difficult, um, you know, to, to adhere to. And Nigeria is a very challenging environment. And it's really a question of how you maintain those core values going forward. And the biggest thing for me right now, when I look at you know, editorial, the way that we're trying to produce narrative and the way that we're trying to produce stories is really shifting away from balance so, and towards rigor. And I think that that's really where the shift is happening. Um, mm. And I think that that's really something that a lot of publications are realizing. And I think something that I think we kind of realized very early on, the fact that our audiences don't really care for balance because a lot of the times balance tends to mean dumbing down both sides. What they want is rigor. They want you to cover their stories rigorously. They want you to, if you, you know, they don't expect 
publications to be able to cover everything in one story. But the one thing that they cover, I think they cover rigorously. And I think it's really understanding how and you know how to deliver that level of rigor and how to deliver that level of you know of, of realism and and, and and really addressing the real issues and really showing the real issues that you know that, that keeps me up because I think that that's really where a lot of African expertise and a lot of um, a lot of I guess African publications stand to have an advantage over really you know the really big Western uh, publications that we have to go up against. Okay, thank you to everyone who's watched this. Thanks a lot, Ika. Thank you so much. Five Minutes Madness, only you can understand. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre, loans in five minutes. If you ever need a new place to go, you can join me in the world of words. And it seems like I'm nowhere to be found If you look, you'll find me in a book Let's take a ride to the past In the back of a phoenix Let's float around the moon You'll never be alone Now you know where to look Find me, find you, find the world Never be alone, now you know where to look Find me, find you, find the world in the book We don't just think of ourselves as a bank uh, We think of ourselves as corporate citizens with responsibility for growing the economy. Reading and education is a key part of it. But equally important is having access to reading materials uh, at home. A lot of the intervention we've done throughout this COVID is to ensure that people can safely navigate the uncertainties of the COVID crisis and come out of it ready for, you know, to leave again. Let's take a ride to the past In the back of a phoenix Let's float around the moon dreams that we have are limited by what we have directly interacted with. What reading does is it makes it possible for you to begin to live in worlds that don't yet exist. One read creates a discipline of reading. One read puts me on a timeline. It gives me an important book and I have an opportunity to read it and to collaborate. It's almost like having someone who does your book selection for you. If you have editors and people who are really good at this saying to you, this is the book for the month, I, I value that. I want to be able to read in a community. I want reading to be a collaborative thing. I want reading to be a communion. And one read allows me to do that. I will use one read any day, any time. Stranger's Guide is not a typical American travel magazine. Our mission is to dive deep into a single location, commissioning work from great writers and photographers, famous individuals, as well as up and coming new voices. This year, we decided to go to Lagos. And we are proud of the volume we produced, with original work from some of Nigeria's best writers and photographers, working with luminaries like Wale Soinka, Molara Wood, and Femi Kute. We think this is a very special volume, and we're so excited to bring it back to Lagos. Very, very easy. Relax!
Who's up you?